Good morning. Welcome to the Old Shed Workshop. I'm Mike. If you've been here before, welcome back. If this is your first time here, I'll invite you to like and subscribe, and please hit the bell for notifications for future videos. Today, I want to share with you how I make beer flights. There are a lot of videos on YouTube. Uh, a lot of guys make beer flights. Everybody has their own style. So I thought I would share my style with you. So I'll show you some of the woods I use, and then, then we'll get started with some glue up. These are some of the hardwoods, the exotic hardwoods that I use uh, in my projects here in the Old Shed Workshop. Uh, just to go over a few of them so you know what you're looking at here. Uh, this is Paduke. It's kind of an orangey color. And I have yellow heart. And this is a real nice bird's eye maple. I have these all cut a little longer than my finished length that I like. This is some Peruvian walnut that I still had uh, in stock. Again, some Paduke. And this is zebra wood. Uh, moving on, this is yellow heart, walnut, some more of the bird's eye maple. And the next one is walnut with yellow heart and paduke. And then we come to paduke, walnut, this is cherry. And then the last one is walnut, paduke, and canary wood. These are all cut to rough length. They'll be trimmed to final length after they're planed. And uh, so they're just easier to work with if you can get them to uh, a nice... Uh, almost finished size to work with. So let's move on to glue up. And I'll show you how I get that done. Let's start gluing some of these up. I'll show you the way I like to do it. I use uh, Type Bond Ultimate 3 for anything that's going to possibly be near water. And I put it in a smaller container. I just find it easier to work with. The way I like to do this. I know there's a lot of videos out there. Guys use brushes and that stuff. I just like to use my finger because I get, I get excellent coverage. I know I don't miss anything. And the only thing I have to clean is my finger. Make sure you put plenty of glue on. I cover everything well. Don't be too stingy. I put it on both sides. I want real good adhesion. You don't want anything to ever come apart. This is all it takes. I'm fortunate enough that I have a, a real nice old school mom and pop type lumber yard about two and a half miles from my house. I don't buy any wood at big box stores, so I don't make anything using wood from a big box store. Plenty of glue, lay it right in there. I don't have anything to clean, but I have to keep wiping my finger off. I will share with you that uh, you gotta be really careful with this Type Bond 3. If you get this on your clothes, it doesn't come out. You know, some other glues, if you get it right away, you can get the glue out, but you can't with this stuff. This stuff sets, that's it. It's there forever. I'll do this one with you, and then we'll get the other ones ready, and then I'll come back and get the clamps off, and we'll be ready to run everything through the planer. And this is the only thing I have to deal with is the, the glue on my fingers. I'm laying right in there. Another thing is that I try to get one end really lined up well because you're going to have to cut these to your finished length and that is much easier you get one end that's lined up really well there's only a little bit you have to take off so you're not wasting you know these things these types of woods are expensive if you can cut off the least amount possible you're ahead of the game so by the time i finish cut this i'm only taking off Oh, a quarter of an inch, three-eighths of an inch. Try to get them nice and tight. Clean off the excess glue while you have the opportunity. I mean, it all comes off quite easily in the planer. But if you can get it 
as much as you can off ahead of ahead of time, you're better off. I only have so many of these clamps to go around, so I'll take an F-style clamp and just put one in the middle and make sure everything's nice and tight. And I'll put this aside and move on to the next one. So I'm gonna go ahead and glue these up and then I'll get back with you when it's time to get the clamps off and then move on to the planer. Good morning. Through the magic of video editing, tomorrow is today. So now I wanna take the work pieces out of the clamps. To show you what the pieces look like before they get planed so you can see the tops look pretty good and on the bottom you can see the glue residue they all look pretty similar but this will all come off uh, quite easily with the planer so they all look pretty much the same on the bottom the pieces that look real dark the these pieces right here this is just uh, from the, the bar clamps, and it all comes off with the planer. Now I've moved over to my crosscut table saw sled and the first few pieces here are a little shorter than the others. So I had to first trim up one end square and then cut the other end since they're short by eye to a reasonable length to the shortest piece that was in the work piece. So here I'm cutting the first one just uh, to square up one end and then I'll flip it around. You'll see that I'll just cut it to its finished length. So now that's my finished first piece. And I continue this method for the remaining five pieces. So the first three are the ones that were a little bit short. So once again, I'll just square up one end and then I'll flip it and I'll cut to finish length. The remaining pieces can be cut against the stop block. So I first trim to get a square end and then 
I'll put it up against my stop block with my cursor, which I've already pre-measured out to get my finished length. I'll put a link up above to the video I made on how I made the cursor and stop block for my cross-cut sled. Then I will just finish up the last couple of work pieces by cutting one end square and then sliding the piece down to the stop block and cutting to finish length. I want to show you how I marked the centers on these work pieces. These first two were exactly four inches wide, so they were easy to mark just right on two inches. So we'll put those out of the way and I'll show you how I mark centers on odd shaped work pieces. I use a machina scale. This was my dad's. I've had this one for probably geez, 35 years and uh, I rely on it quite a bit. So this piece is about three and nine sixteenths. So how do you divide that by two? Well, this is the way I do it. I start at a corner and I get to a place where I got a number that's easily divisible. So from this corner to this corner gives me four inches. I know that if I mark it at two, I'm dead center. It doesn't matter what the width of the workpiece is. I'll come down here, start from this corner, and I come out to, I could make this five and mark it at two and a half. Doesn't matter. As long as you have something that's easily divisible by two. So there's my two inch mark. And I also like to use an 18 inch scale. Sometimes uh, a 12 inch ruler is not enough. A 24 I find to be a little too big. At, at that point, I go to my framing square. But And when you want to mark a center, you want to mark with a, a scale or a ruler, and you don't get your line straight, put the pencil on the mark, bring the ruler to the pencil line. Then you'll be on. Here's your center line. All the holes will be drilled on that center line. I'll do one more. might be easier to show you on the piece that's got the bird's eye maple. So this piece is three and seven eighths. These are all different sizes. Every single one of these is custom made. So no two are alike. They don't have the same widths. It depends on what I use for cut pieces. This is a half, a little over, I mean, this is three quarters of an inch rather. This is a half. They all come out different. Again, I'm gonna go to four inches. Mark my two. I'll go to four inches again, mark my two, and then take the scale. There's your center. It's dead on every time. I'll mark the last two, and then I'll show you how I lay out the holes. So this one is about three and 11 sixteenths. Not easily divisible by two. This system works really nice. It's very easy. I don't know where I learned it. Some of these little tricks you just don't forget. I'll put links below to all of these things if you're interested. And I'd appreciate it if you do want to order anything that I have in a link below. I'd appreciate it if you use my links because as an Amazon affiliate, I make a very small commission if you go to Amazon using my link. It's not much, but every little bit helps. There's your center. So now let me set up and show you how I mark out my uh, hole spacing. I've noticed in a lot of videos where guys are making bear flights, they get out a pencil and a, a tape measure and they're trying to measure, trying to calculate even spaces. Uh, I use this device. It gives you equidistant uh, marking. Like if you were making a, uh, a coat rack with pegs, you could lay this out. So the way this works is I want to get four even spaces. So I'm going to start from the end. I mark end to end and I lock it. And then this, this setting will give me four evenly spaced marks. And once you get them set, 
that's where you drill your holes. And I'll show you again on this one. These are going to be different if the lengths aren't exactly the same. You got to reset each one. So there's my my end and my end. I want one, two, three, four. Okay. So all I got to do is lock this. Just be on your mark. Is your center lines very perfectly even spacing to drill your holes? It goes pretty quick. I have a link below for this uh, gauge, also. Really handy tool if you're doing any sort of work like this. I don't have to do a lot of measuring and calculating. You set it up, make your marks. And then what you do, I'll take I'll take a uh, a square once I have this again. Put your put your pencil on the mark. You bring the the straight edge to your mark. Once you bring it to the pencil, you write on the line. That's how I do it. Don't worry about all the pencil marks. These are all going to be sanded at the end. There you go. All marked out. All right. So I'll finish marking the last three, is the first three done, and then we'll head over to the drill press. Action all set up, I have the drill press all set up, and I've done the first hole just as a test to make sure I had everything set up properly. So I'm not going to do all six pieces because it's repetitive, but I'll show you how I do it. Uh, this is an, a variable speed drill press. So you may hear it start to bog. That means I'm going too fast for the size of the, uh, the hole saw. And that's the same with any bit. If you're using a large size force in a bit, it'll do the same thing. It'll either start to skate or it's gonna start bogging down. You have to find that happy medium. You'll also be able to feel a difference depending on the wood. If the wood is a very hard wood, uh, the, whether it's a drill bit, a force in a bit, a hole saw, uh, they want to go at their own pace. So you can't, you can't rush them. You have to let the tool do the work. And then you've got to pop out the little biscuit that's left. the first one five more to go you also want to as you're drilling down you want to back off a little bit and give the hole saw a chance to cool a little bit as you go because you do generate a lot of heat okay that's the first one at the router table with the dust collection set up I'm ready to turn on the uh, dust collection system and the router from my remote and start cutting the first piece You'll notice that I have a block of wood Beside the work piece That's so I don't get any blowout of the end because I'm cutting end grain So you always want a, a backer piece when you're cutting end grain so you don't get tear out or blow out 
So this is the first one. You see I'm cutting the cove. Uh, you may find it a little difficult to follow the edge of the workpiece because you get the mirror, the reflection from the uh, highly waxed fence. I've speeded up the video for the second piece. I'm going to put a link up above to my two-stage dust collection system video. And I'll also put a link to the router fence that I made with the dust collection also. And it's time for sanding. Now it's time for sanding. It'll become evident towards the end of the video what the cove is for, if you haven't figured that out already. But uh, because of the noise, I have the dust collection set up to my sander as well. I'm going to put on my air protection for this part. The cove portion of the uh, bare flight, I use a rubber piece that's off my oscillating sander and it gets in that cove quite nicely. You can see all the cutouts. Okay, so I'll go ahead and sand up the last of the work pieces and then we'll be ready for finish. Ready to put the finish on. This is what I use, walrus oil, cutting board oil. Gives you a nice finish. Uh, again, when I glue these up, I use nothing but uh, Type Bond 3 because it could be subjected to water. You never want to put one of these into a dishwasher. If they get wet, they get beer on them, they get water on them. Just wipe them down, let them dry. But you don't want to put any of these items in a dishwasher. You can put this on quite liberally. And this is the part I like the best when you see them really start to come to life. I usually put a couple of coats. The first coat, the wood sucks the uh, finish right in. Don't be afraid to lay it right on there. I wanted to mention that, I'm sure you've noticed that I didn't give any dimensions on this. The dimensions are subjective. Uh, you're gonna find the type of glassware that you like and the, the hole saw that you need to use based on the dimensions of the glassware that you choose. The hole saw that I use and the dimensions that I use don't make any difference. You know, figure out what type of glassware you want to use. You'll be able to calculate the, uh, the size of the holes and the size of the hole saw that you need, just like I did. Yeah, it's a beautiful finished product, and especially since I'm using exotic hardwoods. I'm the only person around here that makes these, so all you guys watching this, You'll all end up being my competition once you start making yours. So there's the first one with the first coat. So as I do these, I put them aside on a, on a little piece of towel and let them dry. I'll do a little bit of each one of these so you can, you can see them just come to life. I love the, uh, the walnut and the yellow heart. The yellow and the brown goes really nicely together. It's one of my favorites. I don't usually put the yellow heart on the outer edge. I usually put the walnut on the outer edge, but it was time to try something different. I got the yellow heart on the outside. And that'll get people asking questions. How did you get that wood yellow? You know, something people aren't familiar with. They'll ask questions. You know, you can see it really just, colors just wake right up. Yeah, beautiful wood. I guess I'll finish this one with you. And then I'll finish the other ones up. I just wanted to welcome you back if you've been here before. And if this is your first time here, I'd like to invite you to like and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications for future videos. I have a lot of viewers, but if you were to subscribe to the channel, if you felt so inclined, it would really help me to grow my channel. All the links below that I have are items that I would hope that if you do decide you want to buy any of those items, if you use my link to go to Amazon, as an Amazon affiliate, I would make just a small commission on those. 
it's not much but again as i've mentioned before every little bit helps this is a real nice combination here this is the one that's paduke walnut and cherry where these colors come to life this is these these colors are just so rich looking together i really like these together so rich looking and get the orange the brown and the cherry so i'm going to put this one aside i'm going to do the last couple and then i'll be back with you to show you how the glasses fit in these the particular glassware that i chose for my projects so i'll put this down and i'll be right back with you all right i have the first coat of finish on each one and now i want to show you with the glassware this is the one i was telling you is one of my favorites with the the paduke the walnut and the cherry and these are the glasses that i use and the reason for the cove as i'm sure you've probably figured out by now is to make them easy to pick up when you pick them up you hold them in the bare flight and when you put them down the beer flight sits flat on the bar or on the table or wherever you're serving them. They're a little wet because they've just been finished. Uh, I'll show you another one. I'll go over these woods again with you. This is walnut, paduke, and zebra wood on this one. And that's the way they fit in there. Just like that. This one. This one is Walnut, Yellow Heart, and Paduke. So I like the fact in this design that when you put them down, the glasses aren't sitting on the flight. You can pick up the glass individually and the flight is separate. And here's the one with the uh, yellow heart, walnut, and bird's eye maple. I think it's a nice color combination. So if you if you don't have the coves cut out, I think it just makes it more difficult to try to pick up from the edges. But with the cove, you can you just grab them, lift them right up. This one's the one that's really really rich. Oh, I did that one. Here's another one. It's very similar to this. This is walnut, paduke, and this is canary wood. So, there you are. Again, your dimensions, your width, and your length could be different. Your hole size could be different. It all depends on the glassware that you choose for your beer flights. So, I hope you've enjoyed this video as much as I've enjoyed making it. And we'll see you on the next one.